And let's bring in Jesse Weber, News Nation legal analyst and anchor and host for the Law and Crime Network. Uh, Jesse, good morning. Are you surprised? This was a big shocker to a lot of people. Yeah, it was a big shock. We didn't think that we were going to get an indictment this week. We thought might maybe next week. We knew the grand jury was also going for a break, and we thought maybe there would be an indictment by the end of the month. What I think might have happened is the jury, the grand jury might have actually voted earlier in the week, and this indictment was held off uh, actually being announced and being delivered to Trump's attorney until yesterday. I think one of, if that was the case, one of the reasons could have been security, safety for the grand jury. I think that was one of the main concerns for the Manhattan DA, that if their grand jury's indictment came out and they were still within the Manhattan courthouse, if they were still within that vicinity, that might have been a danger to them. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if they voted earlier in the week and then this uh, indictment was actually announced to uh, Trump's counsel and ultimately we all found out. We haven't seen the indictment. We don't know what is included. We don't know what the charges formally are. There have been uh, speculations that this is about falsifying business records. Uh, but we had conversations earlier this week about whether this could be tried as a misdemeanor or as a felony. What do you say to those who believe you can't bump up the charge if it is falsifying business uh, records uh, from misdemeanor to felony because it was Mr. Cohen, his name obviously in the news a lot, not Mr. Trump who committed any felony? They Well, I would say it's a good argument, but you can hear the prosecutor actually being able to do that. And let's just be clear about why he would be able to do that. So the idea is you falsify business records, which you indicated is a misdemeanor, but it bumps up to a felony if it's in furtherance or covering up another crime. And we're trying to understand what could that crime be? Could it be a state election law violation or a federal election law violation? And one of the complications is you're talking about a state business law applying to a federal presidential election. So if we had to guess, and, and our, we're trying to wonder how many counts there would be in this indictment, it might be actually several counts if they broke down the payments that each time there was a reimbursement of Michael Cohen, that itself could be a separate charge. So I think we're clear that hush money payments are not illegal, but it was paying back Cohen and that coordination that would be a potential crime. Now I will tell you that even if the DA charges it like this, I think former President Trump has a very strong legal argument to maybe get this dismissed or at least challenged in open court. Um, we've said it before, we've said it again. If that is what the charges are, I can understand why people would say this is a weak case. Right. If there's something error that we don't know, that's a different story. Well, let's bring in Niall Standish from The Hill uh, to continue this conversation. Jesse, I want to keep you with us as well. Uh, Representative Ronnie Jackson from Texas, uh, Trump's former White House physician, uh, tweeting out at news of this indictment that this is a national embarrassment to our justice system. President Trump has been proven to have done no wrong. This is nothing more than a stunt to prevent him from becoming president in 2024. What is the stance by Republicans that Mr. Trump did nothing wrong, Nile? Because we keep hearing that over and over again. Even he himself speaking at a campaign event saying there was no crime, there was no affair. Where is the there there? Well, the potential there is this issue of misrecording expenditures that were paid to support this hush money deal and the potential potential uh, federal f uh, election law violation that Jesse has just been mentioned. In saying all that, Republicans are obviously outraged about this. Alvin Bragg has done an extraordinary job in one respect, which is uniting the Republican Party. It's only a few months ago that support for former President Trump appeared to be fraying in the wake of the midterm elections. This has really brought all the Republican Party back on his side, really rallying around that Trump MAGA flag and it causes obviously challenges to his potential rivals in that respect. I have to go back to Jesse. Is there any way that a part of this defense by the former president would be, how can you tell me what I did when I wrote these checks to my then attorney, to Michael Cohen? How can they connect the dots between, oh, I was reimbursing him for hush money payments or I was just paying my lawyer? Is that the, the, the legal standing that you think he's going to take? I think that's one of the main arguments. You know, what was the intent of the former president? Did he really understand what these payments were? I thought these were legal expenses. I'm paying my attorney to take care of a problem for me. That's why Michael Cohen's testimony, as important as it is for the state's case, is also problematic because he has a credibility issue. I think it's going to be backed up, though, by perhaps text messages, perhaps email exchanges. We know David Pecker uh, from AMI, who actually spoke in front of the grand jury, testified in front of the grand jury. That's going to be important as well. But Trump's intent, 
Trump's knowledge is going to be key to this case. And we also know that he kind of speaks in code and ambiguous language, which might also be difficult for a prosecutor. But you're 100 percent right. That's one of the avenues I think they're definitely going to go. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.